Um, so just to uh, start off with though, to say that the next class is on Friday. It's not on Monday. Uh, it's at 2.30 in the same room. Um, and that will be the last class of this group of four. So I hope to cover in that class, although I don't think I will have a chance to. But I certainly will at least be number one. Um, the first one that, that was asked for by some of the people in this class of working on uh, time-based systems. So we'll look at how you deal with modeling dynamics and time-based systems and some cautions related to that. And then uh, maybe get on to some of these other topics at the end, or at least just introduce them so that you're aware of them. Um, and then of course after this uh, set of four classes are finished, you're always welcome to email me and I'm on campus most of the time so I can work with you on any of the problems. We're going to cover a second empirical model. Yeah, uh, well PLS is an empirical model. Um, so what I was planning to do in this section is just to just to talk a bit about empirical models in general and, and, and the philosophy of empirical models and what's been out for. Um, so is that a topic you'd like to be more about? Okay, good. Yeah, so I'll probably cover the first two and then touch on the last two. Okay, so just to uh, put PLS into perspective again, uh, we've, uh, sorry about this, uh, someone looked up the overhead, uh, the, the screen rather, so you may not see the titles quite clearly. But, um, so multiple linear regression we looked at in the, in the undergraduate course as a way to predict what a single y from k columns of x. And then we extended that to principal components of regression as well by, by summarizing those k columns first into a much smaller number of A columns, scores. So it's a two-step process. We predict the scores, T, given our X, we multiply by the loadings from the PCA. So this step is known as a projection step. You're projecting your X observations onto the loadings. Uh, so you, that's why sometimes latent variable methods are called projection methods also, because you're projecting, and that's actually it's quite interesting, such a simple matrix equation, t equals xp, means quite a lot. We're projecting um, from our k-dimensional space, we're being projected down to an a-dimensional space. So we go from x to t using the simple matrix p. So whenever you have a matrix multiplication and one of the matrices are orthonormal, p in this case is orthonormal, you've got a projection on your hands. You're going from one dimension, in this case k dimensions, to, to another set of dimensions. So that projection step is done first and then we do a prediction step, that's step two, uh, where you can solve ahead of time for this b vector using the standard b squared equation. But then PLS we, we covered a bit last week, is a way to avoid the two-step approach and we build the model in one go. The difference is that we calculate the same set of schools but we use both the x information and the y information simultaneously. That's when we build the model, of course. We, we then we build the model using both all the of data, but then when we use it in the future, again, we, we do this jump. We get our new vector x, we predict our t's, and from our t's, we're going to predict y. So when you use the model and when you build the model, it's slightly different ways. Uh, so when we build the model, I have the arrows going in here to t, because that's what we're building. Then when we use it in the future, we're going from x to t. In other words, we're projecting to this t-dimensional space, we're going to a lower dimensional space, and we make our prediction inside that lower dimensional space as well. Very much the same like uh, principal components regression. We make the prediction from the lower dimensional space to y. Except in PLS, we've calculated these scores ahead of time slightly differently. Um, we calculate those t slightly differently to PCA. And that's what I'll talk a bit about today. I'll show you the Nikos algorithm for PLS. So once you calculate those, those scores, then you predict the y. And we spoke last week also how PLS is a, extracts the components sequentially. So we get the first component, then the second component, and so on. And at each step, we can use cross-validation to verify we're not overfitting. And I also mentioned that this idea where we're calculating the, load, the model from the x and the y simultaneously has some good engineering sense as well because after all, whatever we happen to put into x and what we happen to put into y comes from the same system. So it makes sense that this model is built 
using all this data in one go. It's that whatever's driving the system, the latent variables, whatever's driving the system up and down, we're going to catch it inside the scores. But those scores end up being reflected in X and in Y. So that's why it makes sense to calculate the X's and the Y's simultaneously. Now, I, I then spent quite a bit of time last week explaining how with PCA, the objective function is to best explain X. But then we went to contrast that to PLS, which has a slightly different objective function. And we broke it down into three parts. It explains X as well. So PLS not only explains, uh, doesn't just do a single step. It, it does explain the X space, but then it goes on to explain the Y space and to maximize that relationship. And we said that the way to, to maximize that relationship is to use the covariance. <coughs> So let's just take a look quickly what we mean by explaining the x space. Um, when we're saying we're explaining the x space, we're, we're calculating mu scores t. And in PLS, we, we've replaced, in PLS, in PCA rather, we used a, a p matrix over here to calculate the scores. But in PLS, we'll replace that and we'll call it w's. So those w's define how we combine the columns in x. So we're combining columns in x to calculate those scores. So it's a linear combination of the x is given by the coefficients inside the vector w. But that vector w, like in PCA, we had p transpose p. So in PCA, we had p transpose p was equal 1. In PLS, we have w transpose w is equal 1 for the 8 component. So we're maximizing that objective t transpose t corresponds to explaining the x space. And then we have the same, same objective but repeated now for the y's. So we're forming a linear combination of the y's given by the c's. We'll call those scores u. So this is exactly the same as before. We're projecting the y's onto direction vector c, and we calculate those scores u. And it's subject to the same set of constraints that the C must be of unit length, and we're trying to maximize U transpose U. So we've got these two sets of scores from our X space, we've got a, t a set of T's, and from our Y space, we have a set of U's. Okay. So we're calculating these scores T and U from X and Y simultaneously. And we're calculating it so that t and u have maximum covariance. Now, last time we broke this down, we said that when we're maximizing the covariance of t with u, we're really saying three simultaneous things. The product of these three terms. So we're maximizing the correlation. Sorry, guys. If you go to the earlier slide, then the, on the explaining x, you have a max p uh, transport P A yeah. is um, how we will get the X A matrix here. Okay, so X A is on in the first iteration, A is equal to one. X A equal to one is equal to your X uh, your raw your raw data uh, pre-processed. So you center and scale your X data and that becomes your X A for the first component. Then we'll do what like we did in P PCA, we deflate and then fit the next component and, and so on goes sequentially. So yeah, XA refers to the um, in the first iteration it refers to the raw data. In the second iteration it's not this, it's not that anymore. So given that the objective of PLS is to maximize this covariance, we break it down into the three parts. We can see that it's got a part to explain X, a part to explain Y and then this part to maximize the relationship between x and y. So we're doing three things simultaneously. This, you can almost see it as like some sort of trade-off between the three, but it is the algorithm is explicitly trying to maximize that product um, and, and increase all those. So yeah, that's just what I had up here. We're explaining x, that's given by t transpose t. We're explaining the y, that's u transpose u. We're maximizing that relationship, or in other words, the correlation between C and U. 
So earlier on when I had this up here and I said we're calculating t's from x and y, I said that we're calculating a single set of scores. I was kind of lying to you because we're not really calculating one set of scores. We're actually calculating two sets, t's and u's. But we really don't focus too much on the u's at all in PLS. Because they have such high correlation with the t's, we're really only concerned with one of them. And you'll see sooner uh, coming up that we're more interested in the t's rather than the u's. Well, actually, it's easy to explain why we're more interested in the t's than the u's. Given that these two are highly correlated with each other, you can think of it this way. In the future, when we're going to use the PLS model, we're going to calculate, we're going to get a new vector x. And from that new vector x, we're going to calculate the new scores t. So this is x nu. And then we're going to calculate t nu. And then from t nu, we're going to get y y hat, the y predicted. We bypass u totally. In fact, we, we, we cannot calculate u because remember u is the projection, if we just go back here, u is the projection of y onto the c's. So u is found by projecting the y's, the known y's, onto c. In the future when we use the model, we don't know what y is. So we can't project it onto the c's to calculate the u's. So really we're never that interested in use anyway. It's more of a tool that we use when we build the model. But we, 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 uh, we build the model with T and U, but then in the future we're really only focusing on using the T's. Um, so it's more of a side issue. Don't worry if, that, if, if that's not very clear right now. But as long as you understand that the T's and the U's have maximum correlation, so if we've got the T's, we, we have a good feeling for what the U's are going to be. Okay, so this, this key point here is this co covariance objective function that we're maximizing breaks down into three parts of PLS. That's, that's the major piece I, will, I, I want you to be clear on. So in the class last week, we looked at this data set where, uh, and I'll, I'll take it up now and we'll look at it a bit more interactively. We had this very small data set with three variables the acetic acid, hydrogen sulfide, and lactic acid concentration in 30 cheese, cheddar cheese samples. And a, a panel of judges then rated each cheese and predicted this taste number. So these taste values are, are numbers between 0 and 50, determined by a group of judges. And then we're trying to see now in the future, can we predict what the judges would have given? Can we predict the taste value given these three measures which we can take in the lab. So it's expensive to assemble a panel of judges and ask them to come taste your, your cheese every time we want to judge your taste. So can we in the future replace these people with instruments? Can we predict what the judges would have given using these three lab measurements? So when we looked at the data last week, we, you, I mean, everyone here in the class is in agreement that there's pretty much one component in this data set, right? We saw all these three variables are correlated with each other, and they're also positively correlated with taste. So if you do the PCA on that data, you will in fact get a single component. And then when you build the PLS model in the software, we found one component as well. Um, but then, this, that's kind of what, where we left it. I showed you how to build the model in the software, and then we didn't really take this exercise any further. So what I want to do now uh, with you guys, do, you mo do most of you have R on your laptops? Still from the course. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, build the least squares model, then a principal components regression model, and then the PLS model in the software. And the reason for me wanting to do that is just to contrast how the three different models perform but also inter the interpretation of the different models. How do you interpret them and do you get the same interpretation from each of the models? So in the notes then to build the least squares model in R, I'll, I'll do it for you, um, although it is in your notes. So I'm loading that cheese data and then, okay, so I'll load the cheese data and then to build a linear model in R, I'm going to regress the taste variable onto the three X's, acetic acid, H2S, and lactic acid. Uh, 
Um, so you can either follow along with me on your computer or you can just uh, watch me on the floor here. So if you regress this in R, uh, you get your linear model. And it's showing us here that, let's take a look. So I've, I've tried to predict taste from these three x's. So the coefficients of the model shows that acetic acid and cheese, uh, sorry, H2S and lactic acid, they all have positive coefficients, so they're all positively related to taste, which is good, that's what we expected. The standard error is 10 units, and the R squared is 65. So let's just keep a track here of, of what's going on. So with You're going to keep track of the root mean squared error of estimation. That's equal to the sum of squares of the errors divided by n. That's sort of like your average error. You take your error, sum of squares, square it, take the average of the squares, and then square root it. We'll record r squared, and we'll record the standard error. Okay. So for multiple linear regression, we're going to have to calculate this by hand. R squared is 65%, and standard error is 10 units, 10.1. So we saw there that the range of the tape variable went from 0 to 50. So is the standard error of 10 units good? We'll just plot the raw data for the actual y. So there's the taste variable itself for the 30 samples, ranging between about 0 and 55. So we're able to predict with the standard error of 10 units. Good or bad? It's not good. It's not too good, yeah. I guess you could say the prediction error is going to be plus or minus two standard deviations. If you're making a prediction of 30, you're saying it could be, the true taste could be somewhere in between that range. So you've got a pretty variable prediction, but then again, this raw data is de determined by people, which are very, very um, not systematic at all. So, so you have to kind of take that for what it is, right? We don't know what the measurement error is in this, in this true Y. What we could do, I guess, is you could give, give the same cheese samples to the judges over and over and find out what their standard error is. And then, then you've got an idea of oh, the judge's variability lower than 10 units. But in this case, we really don't have that guideline to go with. But at least this is kind of the baseline. So that's, that's these squares. Oh, we just need the root mean squared error of estimation. I'll just calculate that by hand here. So in R, you could write something like that, which says, take the model's predictions Subtract it from the true y, and then take the squares, find the mean, and then the square root of that. So it's 9.4, which is comparable to the standard error, as it should be. Okay. So that's uh, for multiple linear regression. Now let's go look at, uh, if we build a PCA model, and do the principal components regression. So I'll build a PCA model, and so PR comp builds the PCA model with R, and we see that the first component explains 75%, the second component explains an additional 13%, taking up to 88% explained with two components. So at least we, we expected the first component to be the major component. The second component here is explaining a very small incremental amount of variability. So I'm not sure where to stop. Is it one component or two components? So what I'll do. So I'm going to build a PCA, uh, a principal components regression model with a single component and then with a second component. We'll just compare the two. So PCR, uh, PCR with one component and then we'll look at PCR with two components and then we'll end up with PLS. Okay. So if I'm using just a single component, let me go extract the T's and the P's from that uh, model. 
And then when I go calculate my t, well, I, I, I take the t's, I just built the model here, p, model of pca. So when I do that, I extract the t's, that column t from, the, from that object. And I'm going to regress the first column of t's, my t1, onto my y variable. So remember that's, that's what PCR is doing. And we'll just compute the summary for that regression. So we've got a single x variable now. Our x variable is that first score, t1. We're using that to predict y. So the model shows that its coefficient is positive, which is, again, understandable. And it's very significant. The p-value is very small, the t-value is very large. So it's an important coefficient. Then we, let's take a look here. The standard error is 10.45. And the R squared is 60%. And the root mean squared error of estimation we calculate by hand. is 10.1. So how does principal components regression compare to multiple linear regression? About the same performance, right? Now what's interesting is What's the interpretation between the two? Let's go take a look at what the first loading is. So there's P1 and P2 and P3. Let's just ignore P2 and 3 and you look at the first loading. So what would you say about the weights? So yeah, each, each measurement from the lab is contributing its own weight. Then those, that T that's calculated from so you say x1 times the seed gas's weight, x2 times that weight, plus x3. So you form that linear combination, you get t1. That t1 then is multiplied by 8.4, which is a very significant coefficient to predict your y predictive. So your interpretation from principal components regression is two-step. You have to look at the PCR model, PCA model first, and then go look at the least squares model and combine the two to get an interpretation of which x's are important to predict y. So in this case, all three x's get equal weights to calculate that first score. And then that first score is multiplied by that coefficient to get y hat. So it's so showing that all three x's are equally important <coughs> in predicting this y. Would you agree with that? So all three x's are used equally well in the model. They've got the same weight and then multiplied by that coefficient. Let's go step back now and take a look at what the interpretation was when we just looked at the linear model. So I'll bring that up again. So here's the least squares model where we predict a taste from the three x's separately. What did the, the multiple linear regression model give us the coefficients? If we had to write it out like this, we would be saying y hat is equal to b0, which is so some offset minus 28, plus 0.3 times the uh, acidic, but look at the look at the t value and the p value for it. Well, another way to look at it is to use the confidence function. So the confidence interval for acetic acid is something from minus 8.8. .8 Six. This is for beta acetic to plus nine point five. So that's a ninety-five percent confidence interval for acetic acid. The, the linear regression model is saying the acetic acid has no, no, no. Um, it's really not important to predicting y. Then plus point uh, plus three point nine times B H two S. So the H2S, is the H2S coefficient significant in this model? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So H2S is, is an important coefficient. This, this confidence interval for H2S does not span zero, so it indicates it's an important predictor. And then we've got lactic acid. So it's uh, plus <coughs> lactic acid is 19.6. Uh, sorry, this can't be used. This should be X. Yeah. Okay. 19.6 x uh, lactic. 
And is this coefficient important? Yes. 19.6, yeah. So, why the difference between principal components regression and which one would you believe? The least squares model or the principal components regression to interpret? You, you believe the least squares model? Yeah, because the projection you, you lost when you project and there's two components. We take more components with the PCR model. Yeah. But if we if we add the PCR model, the interpretation of the first component is still is you need you still got the first component, which is still showing that the C D gas is important, right? Because the PCA model builds up builds on the first component and then the second component. So if you're using a two-component PCA model, it's still saying the C D gas is important. Right? So Say, I mean, you've got three lab measurements, H2S, lactic acid, and acetic acid. What if acetic acid is really, really expensive to measure? So you want to be, you would love to throw out this variable, and least squares is telling you, look, it's not important. But what's going on here? Why are we getting such different interpretations from the two models? It's hard to say. There's, I, to be honest, there's no. Uh, what's happening here is that the PCA is an empirical model, so it sees it sees these three coefficients, and it sees that they are a linear combination of the three can give you your first component, and with equal weight on them, and then then you go on and use that in, in the prediction. The least squares model is just looking at each variable at a time and saying, is this one got any significant relationship? But remember. With least squares, there's that assumption that the x's are independent and that there's no correlation between the x's. Okay? So what's going on here though is in the least squares model is we've got this heavy correlation between the, the three x's. We've got, um, so let's just take a look here again at that plot. So acetic acid and H2S are cor positively correlated, and acetic acid and lactic acid are positively correlated, and, 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 the, and the second component there as well. So we've got very strong correlation between the x's, and I don't have this diagram here in my slides, but remember that one I drew in class that I tried to explain how the, the plane is very poorly defined when you've got very highly correlated x's for these squares. What happens is with these squares, you can, for very small changes in the your data, you can get very different answers. So almost what's happening here is that least squares is seeing these three variables are correlated. It can pick any two out of the three of them and give them an important weight. And it happens to pick H2S and lactic acid. But it could have put an important weight on acetic acid and H2S and left out lactic acid. Or it could have put all the weight on just <coughs> acetic acid and put almost zero coefficients on these. Any one of those models would have worked just fine. Right? Um, so, because, they, because if you, these three are, are correlated, I can throw out these two and just put a strong weight on that one. Because when these two go up, this one's also going to go up. Or vice versa, I could, and in this case, least squared model has just chosen to give this one a small coefficient and put larger coefficients on those two. So when there's correlation in your x's and then you go on to use them to predict y's, you have to be really careful with the least squares model. Not from the predictions. The predictions are fine and they're comparable, but from the interpretation side of things. Okay? So the interpretation for least squares can be very different 
when you've got very highly correlated x's. And you could go try this. If you make some changes to the data and just perturb the numbers by a small amount and refit your mean squares model, you could potentially get very different coefficients at each time. So coming back to the question, which one is right, least squares or PCA? <laughs> the thing is, I, I guess you can't, we're, we're not fitting a mechanistic model here. Right? We have no idea what the true cause and effect is. For us to go find that out, we would need to do a designed experiment where we change acetic acid, H2S, and lactic acid in a 2 to the 3 factorial and do eight experiments with acetic acid low and high, H2S low and high, lactic acid low and high, and do the eight experiments of all those combinations. Then we can say which one really affects the taste the most. But when we just build the data on a data set that we happen to have, when there's very strong correlation between these x's, either model gives you good answers, neither one is correct. From a mechanistic point of view, well, uh, let me say, let me say, not neither one is correct. We, we cannot tell which one is correct from a mechanistic point of view. Because we've not done a designed experiment here to, to move the data around intentionally. So, um, so that was some good discussion, but let's just uh, finish it off by looking at uh, these last two lines. Let's go use a second component now for the principal components regression. Um, so I will do that over here. I'm going to now regress taste onto T1 and T2. So the standard error for this model is 10.07, uh, 10.17, and the R squared is 64.3, so. and the root mean squared error of estimation, just that usual formula, is 9.6. Interesting that the R squared went up, but the root mean squared error went down. <laughs> so yeah, actually it's not. It's expected, right? R squared should go up. Yeah. Standard error goes down. Root mean squared. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Okay. Um, now let's take a look at PLS. Uh, that was the final step. Well, actually, you're probably all interested in what the predictions look like. So just uh, just to plot the taste actual versus taste predicted. So we're plotting predicted taste on this axis and the actual taste on that axis. I'll just leave this plot here because we're going to now build a PLS model and we'll look at the same. same. So you, uh, with your laptops now, you can go uh, build a PLS model with me in the software. And then we'll just fill out the rest of this table here. I'll let you guys do it. I'll give you three, four minutes and uh, you can tell me R squared. And can we calculate standard error for PLS? <coughs> Um, there's no such thing as standard error in PLS, but we can calculate this and, and that. So I'll let you guys do this in, in two, three minutes. I'll take that with you.
anyone calculated the r squared yet for y? So when you go uh, set it over here, just remember to exclude it, exclude the taste variable, and then to create a block called y. So create a new block, put the taste variable into that block. So R squared for this particular model is given to you over here. So 61.7%. So and uh, so you, did you guys get it? Yeah. yeah. And root mean squared error of estimation. Plot the observed versus predicted plot to get the RMSEE. So go to analysis up here at the top. Um, just try to. So if you click on analysis here at the top, and then you go down to um, observed versus predicted, and then it's going to plot the y y versus y taste predicted with one component. I can't put the two plots side by side from R and from, um, from the other software, but you can see. So, so this is plotting actual, um, sorry, actual taste on the x-axis versus predicted taste on the y. So you've got this group of four, five, six samples there, and in the in the other software we get that same pattern of those samples over there. So we're getting roughly the same patterns in those other plots, similar performance as we expect. Because it looks fairly, fairly similar right now. Or would it, is the difference when you apply it to further data? Okay, so the, the difference is if you apply it to new data is that you would be able to get an SPE and a T squared number that tells you your, new, your three new X's you're bringing in are consistent with each other. So that would be one difference. The other, the prediction should be roughly the same for very simple small data sets you usually get very comparable prediction from PLS and PCA. When you get to really large data set with hundreds of X's, then there's no way you can use the new squares. Uh, you just won't even be able to solve for X transpose X inputs. Okay. Yeah. But then if you do that, uh, there's often very little difference between principal components regression and PLS. But to get that little difference, you have to usually fit many more components for PCA in the PCA step. Because it doesn't know which components are going to be useful to your Y, so you have to overfit those X's. Okay. And then I guess this one can handle multiple Y's as well. As well, yeah. So it's very nice. Okay. So you guys get that? Yeah? Okay, so really, uh, really there's very little difference in this specific example between PLS and multiple linear regression. But you could argue that the interpretation from PCR and PLS is a lot better um, in the sense that it's showing that e each variable has equal contribution to to the y predicted, and we saw that as well in the raw data. We saw each variable was lined up with the taste um, with some sort of positive correlation. Um, when I say that I, when each variable is has equal contribution to y, we saw that in the PCR model. We looked at the loadings, right? The P P1 vector for PCA. Let's take a look at the loadings vector for PLS. Now, remember from the discussion last week, we called that uh, W star and C. So we have the W stars, which are the weights for the X space, and then the C value, which is the weight for the Y space. So you see that? 
the three weights in the X space are, are positive, large positive coefficients and they're related to a single large positive coefficient. So we're getting the same interpretation for PLS as well. Okay? So I guess the, um, the one million dollar question is that which one to trust? I mean, apart from the experimental design that you can validate the model, how you can do that? I mean, how you can actually verify which model is more appropriate with the data <coughs> set that you have? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it really depends on what you're using the model for. So model building is very specific for the case it's going to be used when you're making judgments about which one's better and which is not. From an interpretation point of view, neither can be really used to say with certainty what mechanisms are going on in the system. The only time ever, and you can say what the mechanisms are, is if you've done a cause and effect study. No one in the world can build a model for you from data that's not from a design experiment and say to you, this is what's going on with certainty. There's no method. Neural networks, PCA, these squares, none of these tools. If you've not put in intentional change into your system, you cannot say anything about the data from it. You can guess. You can say these variables are correlated and related to each other, but you cannot say with certainty. So from that point of view, neither model is, is better than the other. From a prediction point of view, I would argue that tools like PLS are usually more appropriate than multiple linear regression. Multiple linear regression works fine for certain data sets like, like DOEs, where you've, where you've made those changes and your X space is orthogonal or nearly orthogonal. But the moment you start getting tightly correlated Xs, a key assumption for using multiple linear regression is now false. So then something more appropriate like PCR or PLS would be, uh, would be more suitable. Furthermore, PLS and PCR both give you that very attractive check on SPE and T squared. So you will calculate first the SPE value and the T squared value for your new X and then go on and make a prediction. Whereas multiple linear regression, you're just putting it in and you're hoping you get it. You're going to get an answer, but you've got no certainty on the quality of the data going in. So it's kind of like the garbage in, garbage out. This one says, no, hang on, you've put garbage in, so there's a check before you go ahead and predict. Whereas Peter, MLR just will always give you a prediction. Uh, question. If you have, like, for this example, because you have uh, three variables affect the test. If you have uh, like uh, data, like hundreds of data, how you can pick which one or which two maybe there is many variables affect these two to build the PLS model? Right. So we'll, that's why you're coming now to that topic uh, on empirical models and the cautions and what empirical models are doing. So I, I will definitely address that next week. Yeah, so, so in this case, yeah, we've got a small number of x's, but we've got many x's, what will happen in those cases? So I'll, I'll talk a bit about that on Friday. We'll get to that on Friday, yeah, that's good. Question. Any other questions before we go on to the next PLS case study? Okay, so what I'll do is, uh, we'll, let's go through the next study, which was this one over here. Um, the Predicting final quality from the LDPE system. So this was on page 26 of your notes. So just to give you a bit of background what this data set's doing, I didn't really give enough of a description here. But we have these 14 process measurements from a, from a reactor system. So it's a two-stage reactor for uh, polymer production. Uh, low density polyethylene. And we've got 14 X variables. They are measuring things such as temperatures, flow rates, and so on around these two reactors. And then we've got five Ys. So uh, actually that should be M is equal to five, not K is equal to five. M is equal to five. Conversion, number average molecular weight, weight average molecular weight, number of long chain branches, and number of short chain branches of this LDP. And there's 54 observations in the data set. We'll just use the first 49 to build the model. Okay. So the first question is here is to build the PCA only on the X variables. 
and then build a PCA only on the Y variables. And then the third step is to build a PLX. The reason why I want you to do the three models, the PCA on X, PCA on Y, and then PLS, for each one of these, I want you to look at the loadings. So in this first model, we're going to have a loading called P because it's PCA. We're going to have a loading with 14, 14 variables in it. And then we're going to have loadings here in model 2 when you're doing the PCA only on the Ys. We're only going to have five variables in that PCA model. What's going to be interesting then is when we compare the loadings from model 1 and 2 to the loadings that we get from the PLS model. So remember, PLS is very similar to PCA, but it's building those scores from both blocks of data at the same time. So do you expect, just from the number of components, do you expect more components than the two combined, or fewer components than the, than the two combined, or the same number of components as each one? So we're going to look at some, some of those ideas. So let's, uh, let's start by building the PCA first on the X variables. So just load up the LDP data set. Um, so so new import data. So you should have this one from last week, LDP. And open that one up. It's normal data. And set that first column to be your primary observation. And pull the rest. And then here at the end, you'll see your Y variables, conversion, MA, NW, LCD. And S. Okay. We just leave the, the default as is, finish that up, and we can say OK. Save that. So everyone's at this screen. And then you just go to uh, variables and scroll to the bottom and exclude those last five. We're only going to build the PCA on the first 14. we call this model PCA on X. <clears throat> so just before we fit it, just double check K is equal to 14. Oh, I forgot to exclude those uh, those 49 rows. I don't think it makes too much difference, so let, let, I'll just continue on using all 54 rows. But if you have already excluded the last, I was going to, I was asking only to build the first 49 observations, but uh, I don't think it makes too much difference. <coughs> Okay, so seven components by cross-validation, just on the X space. <coughs> and I'm just going to focus firstly on the first two components. It's a data set from last week. I'm still going over last week's stuff. Is it not on the website? Yeah, it's just not. No. You got it? Yeah. Okay. So just to, uh, just to take a look here, we've got, this is a polymer reaction system, and I, you don't, you're not expected to know what every variable means here, but for example, what's going on here is we have uh, the, the Initiator going into the into the reactor, so we've got the inlet temperature T in. This is the sequence variable T in. And that's the flow rate of the initiator into the first reactor. T max is the maximum temperature somewhere along. This is a very long thin reactor, so T max is at some point along the reactor we we measure the maximum temperature. And Z one is the distance from the beginning of the reactor to where we find that maximum temperature. So it's a long thin pipe with thermocouples instrumented all along the pipe. And somewhere along the pipe, we measure the maximum temperature, T max. And Z1 is the, is the distance from the start of the reactor to where that maximum temperature is found. Uh, and then we've got similar sorts of variables for the second reactor. So we see here in particular that Z1 at distance is negatively correlated to the actual temperature. That maximum temperature that we record 
the higher that maximum temperature is, so if T1 max is high, it says Z1 is small. So if, if T max 1 is very large, it means it's usually earlier on in the reactor. It's, it's earlier on in this pipe. Whereas if that maximum temperature is a lower number, it's, it's further down the tube in the reactor. And the same interpretation for T max 2 is negatively correlated to its distance down the reactor. Okay. So I just want you to see this plot because we're going to compare this to the loadings plot from PLS in a minute. So these are the two dominant directions for PCA. Together they're explaining 26 plus 19 percent. Yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's those two components. Now let's build a PCA model of the Y space. So once the, once the material passes through the reactor, there's five measurements taken on the, on the final properties. So let's do that model, new model, and we create, a, just thinking if I should just create a new block for it. Yeah, create a new block, and we'll just put these five, five over there. We'll call this Y. Block type is a Y. So we're going to call this block of five variables. We're going to call that Y, and the block type is going to be a Y. But then, importantly, when you go back here, uncheck the include. So we've got two blocks of data, but we're only going to build a model on this first or on this, on this other block, on the Y block. So we'll just build a PCA on that. If we, if we don't do that, it's going to build a PLS model. We'll come back and do that later. But for now, just uncheck the first X block, say OK. So we'll call this PCA on the one space. And just to verify, we've got five variables on 54 observations. OK, so fitting that gives us two components explaining roughly 90 odd percent of the variation, more than 95. And I'm just going to superimpose the loadings here. So P1, P2. So we don't really we don't have to look at a third component. Everything is captured by these two measurements. So even though we measure five variables in the lab, we still only have two degrees of freedom really here in the process. Okay. And so uh, we see some things here that we would expect that the number average molecular weights negatively correlated to short chain branching. The conversion is positively related to the long chain branching. And then this variable molecular weights uh, weight average molecular weight is kind of there in its own. Now, it's interesting, I just want to put this out here for you so that you're aware of this. Um, we're saying we're in a two-dimensional space, which is found by the number of components, and that's the loadings plot over here. Now, you could also mentally reorient yourself a little bit differently to understand this a bit more. You could put MW over here and put MN down here and put <coughs> chain branching and <coughs> conversion Y here and put short chain branching up here. So just rotate it all a little bit. Your interpretation doesn't change. You're just you're not exactly oriented in the directions of greatest variance anymore. But you're still in a two-dimensional world. It's just maybe a little bit easier to interpret it this way um, than the original plot. I mean, it's not to uh, what I'm saying to you is that it's not totally wrong to to see it like this. Just to make, just rotate it a few degrees around. You're still in a two-dimensional world. Things that were negatively correlated across the diagonal this way are now more in line with the T1 axis. It's just, it's not the true first component 
but it's very close to it. You're not going to be totally wrong by doing that. So that's some, some things that we do sometimes just to try and explain things to ourselves or to other people. You're still in a two-dimensional world, and that's the, that's the key thing here. You've, you've maintained all the relationships between the variables. Okay, so now let's build the PLS model, and we'll go to look at the loadings plot for the X space and the Y space. In other words, the W star C plot. So uh, model, uh, new model. And this time you can include that. Just go back up to variables here and make for the and make sure that um, those last five are excluded. Okay. So just go exclude those those five because they're going to be in the Y space. Say okay. No. no, no, I haven't excluded any rows. Because there are 54 data rows. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, yeah. I was going to do the model with just 49. But uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just working with, with 54. Yeah. Okay, so we're finally getting to our PLS model. So just before fitting it, double check. You should have. So you should have 54 rows, K is equal to 14, um, and then your Y space is five, five columns. So auto fits. Okay. So remember in the previous one we had seven components for the X space alone. Right? Yeah, we had seven components for the X space. Let me just put it here. PCA on X. PCA on Y, but now PLS has six. Yeah, yeah. The reason why those those I wanted to exclude those others is because those are actually those are outliers that start to happen. Um, but you, you, it's not really going to affect too much now on it's just for checking this list right now. But yeah. So we get those now are these two components and seven components included in these six or are these six totally new components? Um, let's go and take a look. Because remember we said earlier that PLS explains both X and Y and tries to make those latent variables that it calculates so that there's maximal relationship between the X and the Y space. So it's interesting then to go check whether the first two components in the PLS model are similar to the two components here from this space or from this space, or is it both, both the spaces, right? Um, so the easiest way to do that is to throw up the W star C plot. So in red we have the variables from the Y space and in black are the variables from the X space. What do you notice about those? Uh, both because we have Z1 with the T max, which is a positive correlation. Yeah. Z2 with T max 2. T max 2 is now yes. yeah. oh, there it is. Yeah. negative. So, we see, so we're getting very similar interpretation, at least from the black uh, points from the X space. How about the um, first two components in terms of the red variables, the Y space variables? Pretty close, but it's flipped over the Y or the X. Yeah, so that's okay. We, we, we've seen that before, that as long as you're flipping the signs, it's okay. So in fact, the first two components from PCA and PLS happen to agree in this, in this situation. Um, and that, that, that's interesting, that's good. Um, I mean, we don't, we don't all, it's not bad if it doesn't happen, but it's, 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 it helps the interpretation that if we can go and understand the X space first and then the Y space afterwards. 
Now, let's ask this. If you wanted to go increase the conversion in the process, so this is an outcome variable, conversion. If you wanted to increase the conversion, which of your process variables might you want to go change? Which of your x variables could you go and adjust to increase your conversion? T max two. What would you do to T max two? Increase it a lot of more conversion. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you may not be able to increase T max two. You might be able to increase or decrease Z two. By decreasing z2, you know that that x is correlated with that x. So by decreasing that, you're going to increase that, which will then lead to an increase. So you could not every x variable can be moved. Some of them are just measurements that you happen to get on your process. Okay. So you have to find the manipulated variable. So that in, in the, of, of the black variables, a subset of them are manipulable. Manipulatable. I mean, sorry. Flow rate. In fact, that would probably be the manipulated variables to adjust the flow rate. If you increase the flow rate, the throughput, the plug flow through the reactor goes faster, so Z moves earlier, so Z becomes smaller, and therefore your temperature goes. So yeah, there's probably only one. The only manipulated variables are the flow rate, maybe pressure, and then also the temperature of the coolant going in. So there's only about three or four truly manipulated variables. The others just go up and down with it. Oh, this is change conversion, what else would change from your y variables? If you increase conversion. Uh, because it's correlated. <coughs> right? Sorry, what? Yes. CBY. This one, yeah. This one, yeah. So correlated. your long chain branching would go up, your short chain branching would go up, your number average molecular weight would go down. What, would you affect MW by changing conversion? Not much. Not much. So you can you can adjust this Y independently of these Ys over here. So the W star C plot to me is always the most powerful plot in any model. I this the first the first plot I always throw up to figure out what's going on in my system because you're seeing so much. You're, you're using the black data points to figure out the relationships between. The, the measured variables, your x's, you're using the red data points to see the relationships between the y's, and then you can also start to see how you can adjust your, your y's from your x's. So the relationships between x and y. So this really captures PLS very nicely. Remember we said PLS explains the x space, those are the black points, the y space, the red points, and then the relationship between x and y. So it's a tremendously very uh, informed plot, this one. Now, that's the, um, the loadings plot. How about the observed versus predicted plots? Let's go take a look at how well this model is able to predict the Y space. So we saw over here, uh, let's just bring this back here, this R squared refers to the Y space predictions. So the first two components explain 67 and 20 percent, so about 87 percent of your variability. But that's for all five Y's combined. Uh, each of those five Y's explained with 87 percent, or is some explained better than others, and then the average is 87 percent, right? So we don't know. Let's go take a look. Um, I think it's up here. Analyze model. So you would go to variable summary, and then under block you have to choose. This one with no name was our x block, and this is our y block. 
So let's go look at our Y block. And using six components, well, actually, let's change that just to two components. Let's just see what the variability is with two components. We're seeing with only two components, we're explaining yeah, pretty much all the variables are explained with around 80%. Maybe MW is explained slightly lower with two components. You can go repeat that for the X block. So analysis, model, variable summary. And for the X block, the block with no name, after two components. So those first two components really explain most of the variables except for the inlet temperature and the uh, solvent flow rates. Those are not well explained by the first two components. Maybe they're explained by the third component. So uh, to figure that out, you would then go look at the W star 3 plant, and maybe the TC values have large weights in the third, in the third uh, component. Let's go take a look actually at that. So analyze load use plot, and um, let's plot as a scatter plot, W star 3, W star 4. Series. So um, I don't see the I wonder if we can brush in this plot. This is yeah, we can brush. So the solvent flow rates, these this was this R squared after just two components. Here I'm plotting W star three and four. We're seeing the solvents are important in the fourth component. That are heavily loaded in the fourth component average. So that's, wrote, that's what probably what those additional components are explaining. The first two components, remember, are explaining a lot of the Y space variability. Mm -hmm. And then the third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth components are starting to explain more and more of the X space. Let's take a look at how, how do I see that? The first two components explain 67% and then 20%. So we're up to 87% of the variance explained. This is for R squared Y. The third component explains 3% of the Y. Then the fourth component explains 2% of the Y. The fifth component explains 1% of the Y. So really, components 3, 4, 5, and 6 are not adding much more to the Y space. Components 3, 4, 5, and 6 are really adding on to explain the X space, which we saw here earlier. The X space needed seven components initially. So in PLS, the first two components are explaining this and quite a big chunk of the X space, but then we need these additional components. Components 3, 4, 5, and 6 are really starting to explain the X space much more completely. <clears throat> so when we're looking at PLS's objective function as maximizing that covariance, it's, it's, it's almost like there's a trade-off. The first few components are going to be very predictive. The X is going to be predicting Y, but then after after the additional components, there's going to be, it can't do everything every time. It's going to start filling the X space more and more, or the Y space more and more. So always take a look at the breakdown. I, I usually like to plot a table of the form where A goes 1, 2, 3, and I plot R squared X and R squared Y. So I can see which components are doing what. So here, if I had to fill out this table now, I would write in 67% uh, and then 20% and then 4%. Uh, Whereas for the X space, I don't think there's any easy way for me to do it here um, other than having to go, maybe there is a shortcut. Sure. Um, wait, no, there we go. Yeah, I, I guess I'd have to go look for it in the software, but um, then I, I see then this gives me a, a mental breakdown of which components are explaining what. Usually the first components explain both X and Y. And then after a few components, there's a bit of a trade-off. Some components explain X and other components explain Y. Um, just before we take a break, I just want to point out, um, we, never, we never really got a chance to look at the observed this predictive plot. So uh, let's just take a look at that for some of these variables. The conversion. Um, so conversion is well predicted. So using all six components, we can explain conversion very well uh, with very low root mean square error. Um, 
But yeah, just remember this number is going from 0.126 to 0.138, so you have to take that RMSCE, take that into account. And you can go look at the at the there's five y variables, so you can go plot this up for each of the each of the y's. Then the other interesting thing to go plot is um, we've we've been saying this the whole time that PLS maximizes the correlation between the t's and the u's, but we've never really plotted the t's and the u's. Let's go take a look at um, analyze score plot, and then you can change under this drop down over here. You can go find the u's. So plot t1 versus u1. Add that as a series and say OK. So there you can see that correlation between t's and u's. It's pretty, pretty tight. And you can go plot the second component's correlation because it can't be as strong as the first component. The first component has to have the greatest correlation. Then let's go plot, analyze scores. We'll go change t2, u2. Those are block uh, block scores. Yeah, we we're not I'm not covering multi-block models in this class. But yeah, you could you can potentially have systems where you've got an x1 block, x2 block, x3 block, and then a y block. And then it calculates block scores and scores for each. Yeah, but we're not we're not dealing with that <laughs> just yet. So, so T2, U2, and series. So there's, that's the first one, and then the second one is a bit more scattered to it. The correlation is less strong than the second component, and so on. Okay. So that pretty much covered all the questions from the LDPE system. We looked at which X, X's are strongly related to conversion, we looked at which other quality variables might be adjusted and how could you adjust yeah. So let's take a break for about 10 minutes and then we'll go on to some of the newer stuff and then some of the other exercises. So I thought just just go through this a little bit. Um, this is really not, not required to understand anything um, too much. I mean it's helpful to see what's going on here. When we built the PCA model earlier on, we were we had these arrows going from T's. So just imagine the green arrows cut off there. We just had this T. So we took a column T that we started off with, and we regressed every single column from X onto this T and calculated a regression coefficient. We stored it. In PCA, we called this a P rather than a W. Then we went and did another round where we regressed this we took this vector and we regressed every row of x onto this vector and calculated the regression coefficient and stored it into column t and we flipped between the two until convergence. With PLS we follow exactly the same approach. Um, the difference is now we start going with the column u and you take u as any column from y. As you're starting u, just pick any column from y. Well, in many cases, your y is just a single column, right? You only got one y variable. So take your initial, your initial guess for u as a column from y. Now what we do, though, is we regress every column from x onto that u. So this is showing how much this column in x is related to that column from y. And if, those, if that column from x is strongly related to y, you're going to get a large regression coefficient over here. So the regression coefficients in W are an indication of how much x is related to y. Or at least that column of x is related to that column of y. In other words, it's showing you the, co the covariance between x and y. What we then also, what we do then as the second step is we take every row in X and we regress it onto that set of regression coefficients that we've accumulated here. So we regress every row in X onto that W vector. That will show you if this coefficient is large and, or sorry, if this, there's a certain pattern to these regression coefficients. Some are going to be large, some are going to be small. If that row follows a similar pattern, this, this regression coefficient is going to be 
a large regression coefficient. And that rho has no relationship to the pattern, and it's going to have small weights or a small regression coefficient. So we store up these t's of each row. Then the third step is to go regress those, uh, sorry, regress the column from y onto these t's. So as before, again, if these, if the particular column for y is strongly related to the pattern or the, 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 the pattern you see in those t's, then it will have a large regression coefficient c. And then those c's are accumulated and we go and regress every row in y onto the c's, store it back up in the So it's very similar to PCA, except we've got two extra of these arrow steps. And um, convergence actually is much faster for PLS. And interestingly, if you have just a single y, so one column in y, you will converge in one, one iteration. So then there is no need for running convergence. So it's a, the NEPELT algorithm, this is the NEPELT algorithm for PLS. It's, it's a little bit overwhelming the first time you see it and to try and understand what's going on. I don't really want to go into the details for, it, for this. Um, I'd rather you, much rather you understand how to use the PLS models and interpret them, but this, this is helpful to come back to maybe later on. Once you're feeling more comfortable with this whole area, you might want to come back to the notes on this section. There's about two pages or so to describe what's going on with these arrows, and, and um, it may make, may make a more sense for you. But right now, all you need to remember is that, like the PCA, we have this loadings for the X space, which is called the Ws. We have loadings for the Y space, which is is quite interesting. If you imagine, imagine this green arrow doesn't start from U, but it starts from T. And imagine the red arrow starts from U. But, so then it just moves the beginning points to respective vectors. Then it's basically, you can see it's just two PCAs. They're right. totally detached. By, by just interchanging the T and the U, you're kind of building and you're, you're weaving through all, all, all the spaces. And, and so that they have maximum correlation as well. So these two columns end up having maximum correlation. So, so some people like to interpret PLS as two separate PLS, two separate PCAs, but with this linked store space. You, I guess you can see it that way. Now, there is also another, another uh, point here is there's this whole deflation step. And the reason why I just want to mention this is so that you can see where the W stars come from. What happens is after we've calculated one component, we go and remove from x and y whatever variance we have explained. Okay. In order to do that, we calculate a set of loadings, a different set of loadings, and they happen to be called p. So it's a little bit confusing, but they are. The reason why we call them p is because they calculated in the same way as we did in PCA, but they are not the same as the PCA p's. We use those to go and remove whatever we can explain from x, and we create that residual matrix E, and then we set our new x for the next iteration to be that residual matrix. So in PLS, the second component is actually not, not calculated on the raw data, but it's calculated on the deflated data. So we deflate, we're deflating x, so we remove from x the variability we can explain, and then we go fit the next component actually on those residuals. That's why each component is orthogonal to the other, because the subtraction of removing what you can predict generates an orthogonal space or an independent space, so the next component is forced to be independent of the first component. Um, so just let me write out here what happens for the first two components. You can get your new t's or t's from your w. So you say x for the first component times w1 gives you t1. I'll just write that as shorthand as xw1, because xa equals 1 is just your, your center and scale of x there. But now your <coughs> second component, I say it is not calculated on x or xa1, it's calculated actually on the deflated x, which I'll call xa2. But xa2 can be written as x1 or x minus t1 p1 transpose, which should be t1 p1 transpose. So what you're seeing here is really T2 is the relationship not on, on the raw x, but it's actually on x minus T1P1. 
or w, the converse you can see it as w2 is, is relating your, your score to xa2. But that's really not very easy to interpret. When you're looking at a w plot, you would much rather have this situation where t1 is x times w star and t2 is x, your raw x data, times w2 star. Or just for convenience, I'll just write x w star 1, x w star 2. It's much easier to interpret this than it is to remember whatever I'm looking at in t2 is deflated from t1. That's really hard to interpret. So what we do is we create this w star vector, which is help, which just basically means that when we're looking at a loadings plot in PLS, we're looking at the relationship of the variables to the to the raw data, rather than a deflated data. It's really hard to interpret what's going on here with deflation. So the, the stars are just a way to get back to the original variables. And again, if this if this explanation doesn't kind of sit well with you right now, just don't worry about it too much. As long as you, you interpret the stars, that you use a W star plot rather than the Ws. Don't interpret the Ws, even though the software can give you the Ws, Rather interpret the W stars because the way you interpret the W star plot and W star plot is exactly the same way as you interpret the P1 and P2 plot in PCA. If you're comfortable to interpreting PCA plots, you'll be comfortable interpreting PLS plots as long as you're using the stars rather than the Ws. So it's just a it's just more of a mathematical um, thing that you should be aware of. Okay. Um, so, I'd like to move on to the next section here, but before I go on, are there any questions that people have to be or doubts? <coughs> okay, the reason why I chose to do this section today is because this brings together, um, or it provides you rather, with a very useful tool. I certainly have uh, worked on some really productive projects using classification tools, and I'll just try to talk a bit about that. In in between um, the theory here, but it's also a great first application of PLS. We've already looked at PLS from a prediction point of view, where we predicted the, the taste value from the cheeses, and we, we looked at that LDP reactor here, we were able to predict the, the five lab properties. But this uh, classification is very similar. The only difference is this time we're not predicting a continuous Y. So let's just look back at the taste example where we had uh, y was equal to taste. So where we had y actual, which was equal to the actual taste measurement versus the y predicted. And we could make a prediction like that. So PLS is, is good for doing that. But in this case, where we're doing classification, our y variable is discrete. Our y variable is 0 or 1. So we're Basically what we're predicting is something like good or bad, or acceptable or unacceptable. So we're making a binary prediction this time. Um, what we're going to predict here is which group or category or class does a new sample belong to. So I'll use these terms interchangeably, group, category, or class. So you take a sample of data and you want to say, does this belong to group 1 or group 2? Or class A or class B or category A or category B. Um, and this is a very standard problem in, in an area of statistics that's called machine learning. And if you read any of the stuff in machine learning, they love to talk about how they are making their models learn and they use words like people words, like you learn and you train a model and you make the model learn and the model generalizes, which means it just predicts well. So they'll use all these words like that, but really training is, is model building, generalizing is model testing. Um, machine learning it sounds nice, but it's nothing more than models. You're just creating models. So um, typical example is spam versus ham. So if you use Google's email um, or any other mail, the university's email server, when you get a new email, it's going to tell you the server tells or tests whether that email is spam or the opposite of spam is called ham. <laughs> that, that's what it's called. 
you may not know it, but behind the scenes, it's, it's called the spam versus ham problem. So what they'll do is they'll look at your email and they count the number of times the word Viagra is mentioned and how many, like if they've written it V I A G R A, like like is it written all strangely? Then that so they'll count all these features in the email and they'll build up a vector called so they'll build up a vector of features. So for, for your email, there will be a column here, number of capitals, and there may be 18 capital letters. And then there will be a uh, number of uh, numbers, so like numeric characters. And there will be various features that they extract from your email, just looking at the text of it. Is the email an HTML email or is it a, a raw text email? And at the end, they want to use these features, and maybe they'll calculate k is equal to 50 different features from the email, and they will predict a number between 0 and 1, that's whether it's spam or whether it's ham. And the university has said on their mail servers a number 0.6. So anything above a 0.6 is called spam and gets sent to your spam folder. And anything below that is sent to your inbox as ham. So that's classification, spam versus ham, one is all. Another one that's more relevant to our study is if you've got raw materials and you want to say, if I measure a certain number of properties on my raw materials, so maybe K is five, six, seven, eight, nine properties, <coughs> Can I predict ahead of time that this raw material will lead to one of these three outcomes? So now your prediction is A, B, or C. A is leads to fouling. B is um, excessive frothing. C is acceptable. So if you predict ahead of time that it's A or B, you might take additional precautions, which cost money. And if you predict a C, you just go ahead and, and, and put it into your reactor. So you don't need to spend the additional money if you're predicting a C ahead of time. So if you're predicting an A or a B ahead of time, then at least you know when to spend that additional extra money. When it's a, a category C raw material, you just go ahead and use it. Um, this, I mean, I've worked on a project like this where each batch of raw materials was a million dollars. And so for them, it was, there was three categories as well for this company. And again, whenever they got an a, a, they just sent it to a different part of the process, which was able to handle it. But for this, and uh, they only used it in their process when it was a C. So if they got a B, they, they were kind of a little bit unsure. They were, actually, what, they, what this company could do is they could accumulate all the Bs and then blend them with Cs to make it a, a more make it more like a C product. So they could use up the B product slowly. The A is they divert it to a totally different part of their process. So uh, this is tremendously powerful for them. And it was even more so because this product was shipped from a different country. So they could, before the product was even shipped, they could just tell them, look, don't bother shipping it to us. If it was category A, as B and C they could still work. Um, some other examples of this classification are you could take a near infrared probe and you could use that on solid products, so tablets or seeds or uh, food, food type products. And you use that near infrared spectrum. So you've got your, your spectrum over here up over the many wavelengths. So you've got, say, a thousand particular wavelengths measured. You measure the absorbance. And you use this whole spectrum now. So in this case, K is equal to, say, 1,000. And from those, uh, those 1,000 values, you predict A, B, or C. Or maybe you've got a fourth category, D. You're predicting something discrete from many, many Xs in this particular case. Um, and in the final case, uh, this one is used, I know this is used widely at DuPont in Canada and in the US, and they've made tons of money with this. Uh, 
So they run these nylon reactors on a batch system. So they'll put in, in Z matrix, they've got their whole recipe. So they know how many kilograms of ingredient A, kilograms of ingredient B, C, D, E. They'll also put in Z um, the raw material properties of A, B, C, D, E. So they may have things like density, melting point, and a few other properties go into Z. So that's a single row in Z. And then one of these planes corresponds to a single row in Z. These are the trajectories over time. So they will have maybe 10 different variables on their batch reactor. So these 10 variables, so they've got their reactor system here with 10 different measurements coming off. But you've got 10 different measurements over time. So you maybe have your temperature, which is set to be flat at the beginning, then it's set to ramp up to a certain set point, say 200 degrees, and then it goes flat line again, and then it needs to ramp down very rapidly, and then maybe the tail off. So that would be the temperature trajectory. That's just one, one column in that plane going back and forth. Then that, that's, so that's temperature, and then they'll have pressure, which maybe has a different pattern. And then they'll have agitation rate, which is something like that. So you'll have 10, 12 different variables, each measured over time. So you've got all these samples over time. So this is a tremendous amount of data just on one plane. Again, you can summarize, maybe there's about 50 to 100,000 Row, uh, sorry, 50 to 100,000 columns of data points just from one batch. And they're using that information at the end to decide just one of two categories, A or B. Do I release this batch early? Or do I keep it in my reactor, take a sample, send it to the lab, wait 10 hours, get my lab measurement that says, okay, no, this batch is okay, you can continue sending it to the next step in the process. But those 10 hours that that batch is held up here is very costly because this reactor cannot be used for anything else in the, in the meantime. So they save 10 hours or basically increase their production throughput by deciding, using all the process data, whether they can release that batch ahead of time. So then they're, just, they're deciding A versus B. So that's what, that's what the classification problem is all about. We're making a very discrete prediction, A or B, or in the case of spam, is it below 0.6 or above 0.6, or um, in the case of the raw materials, do I process this on, the, on this equipment, or do I need to add some additives to it in order to prevent the frothing? So those are very, very powerful from very simple information. All this information, Z and X, is usually available before you run your equipment. So can you predict ahead of time how your equipment will perform? And then here's another one that um, kind of seems interesting to me. I don't know if this is possible, but so when you go to the hospital and they book you up onto an ECG, they're measuring these time-based trajectories, which is a snapshot of your heart's rhythms. Can they use features extracted from this time series data, like the height from the baseline to the peak, or the, the, the delta, so delta is this way and delta is that way. Various features extracted from those time series values, you build up your, your vector like we did for the span. Like you build up your vector of features and then you use that to predict this patient has got certain characteristics. So I, I guess that's possible, I don't know, I'm just putting it out there. Okay, so when we're looking at classification, there's two types. And this, this designation only refers to how we build the model, not to how we will use the model. How we use the model is the same in either case. But how we build the model, there's two different types. One is called supervised and the other is called unsupervised. So in the machine learning literature, you'll always see this. Someone comes up with a new idea, they'll say this is a, a supervised classifier or this is an unsupervised classifier. When they're saying it's a supervised classifier, it means that when you build the model, you have to know which category that data belongs to. So let's take a look. When you're building the model, the C 
assume you've got a certain number of rows. So n is equal to, let's take 50 rows. And k is 10 columns. So you've got 10 particular columns, that, 10 things that you can measure. And you have these 10 things measured on 50, 50 observations. So this is your training set or your model building set. If you've got a supervised classifier, you're saying, I know ahead of time that row belongs to category A, and this row belongs to category B, this row belongs to category C, this row belongs to category A. In other words, ahead of time, you're telling the model what the answer should be. Okay? You're saying, when, whatever you calculate, the answer should be A. So the student is the model, the teacher is the objective function. So the teacher says, you should get an A. And if you don't get an A for that row, you get penalized. So, and, the, and the penalty is the objective function. You try to minimize the objective function, so you're trying to become more and more accurate. And so the whole process of doing this is just building a model. So and it's nothing that you've not seen before. It's like fitting a least squares model. You're fitting the least squares model to predict C. And your objective function is to minimize the sum of squares of the errors. That's the teacher is saying you've got to minimize your error. The student is the model. And the process of building the model is training. Training is the same. But they like to use words like learning and training, classifying, and so on. Where if it's an unsupervised setup, there's no teacher. You're just relying on the data to naturally spread out. And then you will come afterwards as the modeler, the human, goes and says where the boundaries go. So I'll talk about that one first, and then we'll talk about supervised classification. So unsupervised classification is PCA. So you guys have all built unsupervised classifiers before. How do you do it? Well, we rely, like I said here earlier, with unsupervised classification, you rely on the data to separate itself into clusters. So all you do is you plot your score plot, and you'll see groupings of data. And you can say, well, that's a cluster that belongs to the spam category. Or if my raw materials land up in this region, I know that that's going to cause problems in my reactor. Whereas if it lands up in this region over here, I'll be fine. And if it lands up in this region, I need to take a little bit more care. So you build a PCA model just on your k equals 10 columns, and you rely on the data to separate itself out into clusters. When you build the PCA model, the PCA has no idea that these observations belong to group A. These observations belong to group B or C. So that's why it's an unsupervised classifier, because it meets this criteria that we're relying on the data to naturally separate itself out. Okay? And you can do things like um, build, build regions in the model that are nonlinear. They don't have to be straight lines. You could have said, that's my boundary. And anything that falls this side is A, and anything that falls this side is B. But there's no reason why it has to be a straight line. Right? Because it's PCA. PCA is just building the model to best explain the data. It doesn't know that you're going to use the scores to try and do this sort of thing afterwards. So there's no reason why this line has to be a straight line. A, a more appropriate line could be some sort of non-linear shape like that. Or you may have to draw that curve in T1, T2, and T3 simultaneously. There's no guarantee that in the first two components it's going to nicely separate out in front of you. You may have to have a, a three-dimensional plane to separate your two clusters. And, you, and, the, and when you set that, you're doing that. You've got the freedom to choose wherever that line goes. So you can do things like trade-off. Like, you notice here how I drew the line so that some of the solid points are actually on the wrong side of the line. But there's none of the open points on this side of the line. I did that because in this specific example, this was the case where you're producing a set of product from your process. And after you've produced the product, you take some measurements in your lab and you test it to say, okay, this is good enough to send to my customer. But what could happen is that 
some of those testing takes a really long time. So you could say, you could use other process measurements and decide when it's category S, I'm going to ship it immediately to my customer without waiting for the lab values. Whereas if it's the, on this side, I'm going to first test it in my lab. I would much rather be sure that whatever I ship to my customers is always going to be okay. I don't want my customers to receive the product and then have to ship it back to me. So in this case, remember because there's two types of error you can make. You can have an open point on this side of the line, or you can have a closed point on this side of the line. It's like the whole idea of type 1, type 2 error that we covered in, in the course. I would much rather make an error where I test it in my lab first and then ship it to my customer. Okay, sure, it's cost me a little bit more to test in my lab, but I'm going to be sure that it's okay. Whereas on this side, I don't want any open circles on this side because that's going to be, be very costly. So you can set this boundary wherever you like, and you can take into account these soft constraints like economics and so on. Excuse me. Uh, this, uh, this thing, they do it now online, as you show us in, uh, for the, uh, in the class. Oh. Yeah, so, yeah, so again, this comes, this uh, story over here was very similar to the project I worked on previously, where like this stuff is worth a million dollars. And you know that if you're going to run it in your, in your reactor and it's, and it's going to cause a mess, and you, you're, you've lost a million dollars, right? So you never want a point on this side by mistake. You'd rather, I would rather send my, my raw material to another reactor, and at least it works, than put it in my reactor and it, and it, and it messes up. So, it's, so the point is that some people, like coming back to this problem, sometimes people will put the boundaries so that you get 50% error on either side. So you get half your open points on the wrong. So here, this open point and this open point is on the wrong side of the line. And over here, this closed and that closed and that closed point is on the wrong side of the line. So yeah, I'm saying there's a 50-50 chance that it could, could be on either side. But sometimes it's more important to minimize your type 1 error totally and maximize your type 2 error. So I'm just, what my main point is here is you, as a person, have absolute freedom to decide where that line goes. Right? So, um, so when you look at those plots, you, don't, you, you will almost never get a case like this that I drew here, where everything fits nicely into region A and everything fits nicely into region B. There's always going to be some sort of trade-offs. Or, like this case was uh, the one from the course, right? Where uh, you had the same idea, raw materials, and, and you're predicting the yield, whether it's a good yield. So if you had in green, a good yield or a bad yield. So certain points are on the wrong side of the line. So those green points are on that side of the line. Okay. Now the reason why PCA works most of the time as an as a unsupervised classifier is purely because observations which are similar they must belong to the same group, right? So the material that lands up in group A, their x values are always going to be the same. So multiply those x's by the, by the loadings. So t is equal to xp. Multiply the same row of x by the t's. You're always going to get similar t's. So they're going to land up in the same region in the school space. That's why PCA works, is it? You can go draw these regions in the school. And then the other point to make is that PCA is good when you don't know what, how many groups you have. Say you just have raw data. The very first time you do this, you don't know I have group A, B, and C. As an engineer, you, you may just say, I'm going to just take a look at this data from, my, from the lab or from the process. And you don't know ahead of time how many groups they're going to be. So you don't know. You can't build a supervised classifier because you, you don't know what this information is. So you just plug it in, build the PCA, and then you see if there is any groups. And then if you do find any groups, you can go investigate them separately using contribution plots or loadings and so on. Um, so you can see the different groups in two dimensions, but it's going to be possible that you have groups that aren't really visible to you in only two dimensions, right? Yeah, you have to go look at T1, T3. Ideally, you have a three-dimensional cube that you can rotate around with three scores at a time. 
Yeah. But are there any other like more, you know, <coughs> tools that are less based on just your own judgment? Yes, they are. Um, in the notes I mentioned it, um, what you could go do is you go, go fit a whole bunch of scores by cross-validation, and then you could go feed those into something like support vector machines or k-nearest neighbors uh, or other algorithms, which will then go work on the scores to go find the boundaries for you. And so k-nearest neighbors is an algorithm where you say, I'm guessing there's five clusters, and it will go and try and find the best cluster for it. But the thing is, don't feed it the raw data. That would be silly, because you've got such highly correlated x's. Go feed it the scores, and then it work on a much smaller number of variables. It will also be much faster doing that. So I mentioned uh, uh, SVMs, uh, self-organizing maps, k-nearest neighbors. Those are all tools that, that work quite well for this. Is there a name for those tools as a group? Uh, they're all called unsupervised classifiers as well. Oh, okay. But the, the difference is you're feeding this, those unsupervised classifiers much highly, more highly condensed information. It's not optimization. No, the optimization comes when you've got a supervisor that's able to say you need to minimize your prediction error. Yeah. So those, those are the next ones we'll look at. So like you just mentioned there now, you could have uh, these cases where you have to have these extra components and it's really hard to draw the boundaries because now, if you've got three or four or five principal components, you have to really look at, you're in a five-dimensional space. But because we said with unsupervised classification, it's the human responsible for drawing those boundaries, then it's really tough. So it works well for simple cases like this. But for when you've got many components, then it really becomes harder. Okay, so let's take a look at what supervised classification is. Now, you've all built a supervised classifier already. Uh, all that a supervised classifier is, is you go and build PCA on model one, uh, PCA model one on group one, and then you go build a second PCA on the second group, and you go build another PCA on each group, and you accumulate up to say G separate PCA models, one for each group. So that would be the case like over here where I go and just extract these data and build a PCA model on those observations. Then I build a PCA on just these observations and then a PCA on these observations. Clearly this is a supervised classifier because I have to know ahead of time which observations to put into which model, right? So you have to know which rows belong to group A, B, C and so on in order to go build your separate PCA model. So now let's say you've got the case of three, three groups, group A, B, and C. You've built your models for each group. How do you go use this classifier? So um, yeah, it's a little bit cut off, but this side of the board is building a model. This side is how do you use the model. The way you use it is you bring in your new observation. Now you're not sure, is this group A, B, or C? So you bring in the new observation as new data, and you look at SPE and T squared for the first model, SPE and T squared for the second model, SPE and T squared for, for every one of you want. And which one do you pick? One of the lowest. SPE. Just SPE. Well, oh, it's totally Which one do you? So which? How do you know which model the our new observation belongs to? What is hotelling T squared? You could visualize geometrically as the distance from the center of the model. Yeah. So, let's say if you've got a score plot just in T1, T2, that's your ellipse. Hotelling T squared is the distance from the center to the observation. So, this point has a big T squared, this point has a small T squared, and the point at your center has a zero T squared. So, if you're bringing in a new observation, how do you know which, which group it belongs to? I guess just a two-dimensional of SPD and T squared and then see which is closer to the origin. For, for each one? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could do that for our... Uh, just a model, I guess. Really, it just comes down to you pick the group it belongs to with which one it has the lowest SPD and T squared. 
So if a new observation has small t squared and SPE, that means it belongs to that group. If you've built your model only on data from group B, and you bring a, a group A observation as new data into group B, it's going to have a high, t, a high SPE. So it's going to be way off the model plane because sample A looks nothing like sample B. A spam email doesn't look anything like a normal email from the features. Like a spam email has a lot of Viagra's and other words in it, whereas a normal email doesn't have those words in it. A group A observation that's going to cause your, your reactor to froth or have problems is going to have different characteristics in the X's to a, a, a group B observation. So what we typically do is we bring in a new observation, we say, does it belong to group one? We check the T squared and SPE. But we put more emphasis on the SPE than the T squared. Because SPE is really the one that tells you whether it's consistent with the model or not. T squared just says that you're on the model plane, but you're, you're, you're far inside away. The, inside the ellipse or outside the ellipse. But more importantly is SPE because that's off the model plane. If you've got a high SP, it says this observation is totally different to anything I've seen before. Whereas you can have an observation that's got high SPE and low T squared. That would be a case where in three dimensions, so here's your, here's your plane, this direction is P1, this direction is P2. A point with high SPE would be off the model plane, but somewhere there's what tells T squared. It would just happen to be here. So it's likely you could get high SPE but small T squared. What you really want is a point that's got both low T squared and low SPE. So would you compare to the like 95% confidence interval? Exactly. Yeah. So you say that there's evidence here that it belongs to this group or doesn't belong to it. Could it be like the case where uh, just because of the way the data is, like the model plane for model two? intersects with model one, mm -hmm. and you get this classification that way? Yeah, so I talk a bit about it in notes. There's all sorts of elaborate schemes that people go and set up then. Because what if your new observation has low SPE, high SPE, and low SPE? Does it belong to group one and group three? It could. I mean, there's systems where just the type of category you're modeling, it could be a blend of each. So it could, so it could be belong yeah. to each. But then people go and say, well, I'll pick the one with the lowest SPE overall. Or they will use some rating scheme like SPE counts for two votes and here T squared counts for one vote and then whichever one gets the, the most number of votes wins. So you, you, people do all sorts of things like that. Yeah. But you see the general principle is that you go through each model one at a time and then at the bottom you have the, the catch-all case. If it doesn't fit any of the models, it's saying this observation is something you've never seen before. It belongs to a new category, um, and it's probably worthwhile going to investigate. So that's uh, it's called, this approach is called SIMCA, Soft Independent Modeling by Component Analogy. And SIMCA is fine. The only thing that I find is really tough to interpret why the groups separate. If you're interested in what makes a group one sample different from a group two, you can't go compare the loading plots because they're, they've got different mean centerings and scalings and it's, it's really tough to figure out why the groups separate. Whereas here, with PCA, just unsupervised classification, it's, it's very easy to see why this group is different from that group. You just look at the loadings properly, you just use the contributions. You draw a circle here and a circle here and you say, show me the contribution plot. So it's easy to figure out and learn about your system from unsupervised classification, but from supervised uh, from Simca rather, when you've got G separate models, it's really tough to figure out why group one, two, three, four, and so on are different. Yeah, so then you just read what happens when one group claims more than one observation. It's, there's no right answer. There's, there's different ways of dealing with it. And then finally, another supervised classifier is PLSDA. So PLSDA is PLS, Discriminant Analysis. So let's take a look. When we looked at PCA over here, we had a single model, the unsupervised classifier. PCA is an unsupervised classifier. We had one model. And its objective was not to separate groups. PCA's objective is to just explain the data. But what if we say 
make those latent variables separate each group from each other. Like make that your objective as well. So how can we force PLS to make that our objective? Like we want to make those latent variables not just explain the data, but we also want it to separate the data apart from each other. So what people go and do is they go, remember PLS is also building a model for the Y space. They go and abuse the PLS objective function almost to make it go into these separate directions. So they go and force the Y space like this. So if you've got G groups, you go and say for group one observations, I'm going to put a one in my Y variable and zeros everywhere else. For your second group, you put zeros for group that are not part of group two, but for, for that second group, you put ones in that column in the Y space. And so on, and you go, instead of, we've, you've got N columns in the Y space, but N is equal to G, the number of groups you have. Okay? Now what do you notice about that Y space? What's special about it? It's orthogonal. It's orthogonal, yeah. Y is orthogonal. So remember PLS is trying to explain X, but it's also trying to explain Y and the relationship between X and Y. And PLS is also building these orthogonal components, so you're, you're kind of forcing these orthogonal components to go into these orthogonal directions in the Y space. Because one of, one of PLS's objectives is to explain your Y space. So it's going to try and predict zeros and ones for you. Okay. So the way you should see a PLSDA model is just like a PLS model. The only difference is your Y space is a little bit special. You've gone and especially made your Y space like this. Okay? So when you use a PLSDA model, you use it like a normal PLS. Like you look at the observed versus the predicted plot, you look at the W star Cs, all those tools are still the same. And when you want to use the model, now you bring in your new observation and you look at Y predicted for the first column. So when you bring in your new observation X, you can predict G Ys or N Ys. It's the same thing. You get a prediction of this column, a prediction of this column, a prediction of this column, and a prediction of that column. Okay. So how do you tell which group it belongs to? Very close one. Yeah. So whichever one predicts for you closest to one is the group that you're going to say it belongs to. And hopefully all the other predictions are close to zero. <laughs> okay. But things never work out so nicely. You're always going to get a crazy looking plot like this. So yeah, ideally you get a prediction that's right there at one. So let's unpack this. Your action, this is looking at your training data. This is when you build the model with the software. You can go plot observed versus predicted you'll get a plot that looks something like this. So these are the observations that belong to group zero. Or the, uh, sorry, these are the observations that have got a zero in that column of Y. I'm looking just at one column of Y. And these are the observations that have a one in, those, in that column. But then you look at your predicted Ys. So this observation really was a zero, but it's predicted as negative, negative 0.3, for example. So on. you get predictions, and then these are actually predicted as, say, plus 0.5, plus 0.4, plus 0.5, plus 0.6. These observations that are actually in group one, they don't get predicted exactly as one. They may be predicted above one or below one. So when you look at this, now you're deciding where do I, where do I draw my boundary? You, it's a supervised classifier, but you still have to go draw your boundary, right? So you can, people have different rules for doing this. Again, I can arbitrarily shift this cutoff line to the left or to the right, wherever I want to, to put it. So I say as long as my prediction is above 0 0.6, I'm going to say it belongs to that group. So this was, uh, it's just, just to plot up the data structure here for you. So say we had three groups. So I'm going to have three columns in Y. What I've just plotted here for you is a single column. I just plotted one of these columns. 
you're going to get an observed versus predicted plot for every single y. So you're going to get a, a second and a third column like that. So, so people will say y1 hat above 0.6 and y2 hat below 0.4 and y3 hat below 0.5, then that belongs to group A. So you go and create all these rules to try and define which group it belongs to. So it's, it's a bit messy, but um, it's actually, it's very powerful. It's because, uh, I'll come back to your question in a minute. But what happens here is, remember PLS is now really forcing those latent variables to separate the groups as much as possible. And in all my experience with classifiers, the PLSDA model works really, really well. It gives you the, the strongest separation in this, in the Y predicted, but also more importantly actually in the score space, because it's in the T's, because it's trying to separate those T's out as much as possible for you. Um, so actually, I, I, I very seldom use these plots to, to do my classification. I, I actually go back to the scores, like we did for PCA. I go, but I go use the scores from PLSDA, because they're just like any other scores, right? And I use the PLS scores to do my separation, and I build boundaries like, um, like this. Except these are not the T's from PCA, I use the T's from the PLSDA. Yeah, I think question, when we're actually building that Y matrix in the first place, we're building the model. That means we have to know, based on the measurements we have taken in the past, we have to know which ones of those are in certain groups to begin with. Yeah, so that's why it's a supervised classifier. Okay, so if it was um, pass or fail, say, or maybe going to the next reactor or something like that, okay. um, how, like, is it just like they would know if it's of a certain molecular weight it can go to the next reactors, something like that, would they have um, restrictions there? Or? Okay, so with some of, some of the cases it's clear cut. Like they've used, like in the case that I worked on with the pharmaceutical industry, they put the materials in their reactor and it just started frothing and foaming and they lose their million dollars because they just lands on the floor. They don't do anything with it. So it's very clear, did it foam or did it not foam? Or you could maybe have like a, a kind of phone, so you can have this third category. Yeah. But with cases like what you're saying, should it go on to the next reactor or not? It's it's subjective, right? Yeah. So when you build your model, that's what I was getting at here. That is, you're not going to be able to find two very distinct clusters because often your training data has been decided by people, and it's not the same person always doing the decision making. And secondly, even if it is the same person, that person is never consistent. So building your model is very tough to find where that boundary goes. It, it's, it's a, it's a, you're, you're trading off. So essentially, they were trying to shift um, us being able to classify based on the actual outcome to being able to classify based on the predicted outcome. Or the, input. the idea is that you want to use, move your prediction to a, a computer or a machine that's going to be a, a bit more consistent, but you're training that computer based on human decisions initially. Then later on, you can go rebuild your model, perhaps after you start collecting more data from the computer's decisions. So often these models are rebuilt every few years. They're, like these models are never put online and they, they work forever. No, they, they need some maintenance. Okay. I was wondering what you meant about the Simco algorithm when you said it's hard to understand why the group separate because you have to have them grouped originally yourself, right? You have yeah. to understand what those groups are. Oh, I mean. So I don't, I don't really understand what you mean. So in this simple case here, if you would like to know, you may know ahead of time this sample belongs to group S and this belongs to group L. You know that ahead of time, right? <laughs> and. Now, you're, as an engineer, you're curious, why was this one designated by intergroup S, and why is this one designated to SL? Because you may not have been the one to designate it originally, it might have been someone else. Okay, so you're talking about this subjective classification where we actually don't know absolutely. Yeah, or like the idea where the reactor starts to froth and foam. What is it about my raw materials that causes them to foam? Yeah. I want to learn that so I can tell my supplier, don't do that anymore. 
I call only shipping materials with these characteristics in the future. So we don't, like this is my, sometimes my criticism with machine learning literature. The people in this area love to just go put all their numbers into a data set and through an algorithm and they get their model out to the end and they report R squares and R MSCPs and they're all happy. But they don't go and sit and figure out why. As engineers, we don't want the computer just to learn, we want to learn also. And doing it with the PCA model is easy, doing it with the PLSDA model is easy because you've got one model. But with the Simca model, you've got, you've got this whole cluster of models that you have to go deal with. So um, sometimes people will draw Simca or describe Simca when they're talking about it in the literature. They'll have this sort of illustration. Imagine you've got your three variables, x1, x2, and x3. So group one will be over here. And your first PCA model is up over here. And group two is here. And its loading direction goes in that way. It only has a single component. This group needs two components. This group just needs one component. And then you've got another cluster over here of triangles going in and out the board. And this group actually needs three components to explain that cluster. Why is group A different to B and C? You can't really, I can't compare the loadings from this model to the loadings from this model to the loadings from this model. I, it's hard for me to learn from this. Yeah, this so this is in a case where you just, there are groupings, but you actually don't understand the underlying reasons why. Yeah. So further to that, if you have, if you know or suspect that there's some errors in the classification, then would it be better to use PLSDA or to use SIGMA? Like which one is going to be more robust to? Okay, good point. What I what I always find helpful is on a new on a new set of data. Even if I know the classification, I will first do a PCA, mm -hmm. and I color code my score plots mm -hmm. with that with the zero one information. Then I go and do a, a SIMCA on each group separately, just to understand the dimensionality of that group. This group needs three components, that one needs two components. And then I go do a PLSDA. And the PLSDA is then the one I really end up probably implementing. That's been my so experience. PCA first with color coding, then In the order I presented them, yeah. yeah. So PCA, then PCA on each group, and then PLSDA. And actually, PLSDA usually requires fewer components than any of the other previous models. Usually. Okay. Now, you guys have all built a PLSDA model. If you uh, did the assignment where we had the, uh, this, if, this data, yeah. the six measurements on the, on the x's, and then you had the, the column of ones and zeros, um, I, I jumped over that when that was in the PLS homework. So let's just to uh, let's come back to the study. Do you want to take a two three minute break just to stretch your legs? Or go to the washroom. Or anything? Or, no? Okay. Yeah. Feel free to leave the class if you need to. Um, so let's go look at this in the software.